I guess. All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, so you, the person you just saw, his name is Jeffrey. He is our executive director and also our marine scientist. My name is Melanie. I will be your teacher for this webinar. Uh, I just want to say um, a quick hello and a quick thank you for joining us here. I'm so sorry that we can't be at your school doing this um, at your school, but it's really cool that we have the internet and that we are still able to do this. So we're gonna get started. Our topic today is ocean adaptations and how to create your own ocean creature. We will also be talking about some really interesting deep sea creatures. So let's get started. All right, so I just wanna quickly say that if you are on YouTube Live or even here on the Zoom, um, please do not comment or write any comments or have any conversations in the comment section. Please use that purely for ocean related questions. We are going to do a Q&A at the end of the webinar. So if you find that you have a lot of questions, I suggest writing them down and saving them for the end of the webinar, and then you can type them into the comment section um, so we can do our Q&A with our marine scientist, Jeffrey, and myself. All right. So welcome. Uh, this is kind of a introduction of what we're going to do. First, we're gonna do some introductions of who OPAC is and what that stands for. We're gonna talk about how big is the ocean, we're also going to define what are adaptations. We're going to talk about some ocean adaptations. And I'm going to teach you how to do a DIY, a do-it-yourself, um, of a create-your-own deep-sea creature. All right. So who is OPAC? OPAC stands for Ocean Protection Advocacy Kids. And what we do is we travel to lots of different schools in Massachusetts. That's where I am right now. I am in Massachusetts. And we teach kids how to protect the ocean. And a really big way we do that is through artwork. So we do a lot of songwriting, poetry writing, um, DIYs, like the build your own sea creature that I'm going to teach you how to do, and lots of different creative things uh, to protect the ocean. So that is what Ocean Protection Advocacy Kids does in Massachusetts. And I'm going to tell you a little story about how it started. And this story starts with my childhood. So this is a picture of me when I was about 10 or 11 years old. And I grew up in New Jersey on the Jersey shore. And the ocean and the water and sea creatures were really, really important to my life. And I had a huge love for dolphins and sea turtles and whales, uh, just like any other um, 11 year old girl might like, like dolphins and things. And one summer, um, my friend and I realized that along our beaches in our town or even on the streets of our town, we were seeing a lot of plastic pollution. And we learned in school how plastic pollution affects sea creatures like sea turtles and dolphins. And we love those animals so much that it really hurt our heart to see plastic pollution in our own towns. So what we did is we created our own ocean magazine. And this ocean magazine was really just a bunch of paper that we stapled together. We made it ourselves, we drew pictures and we named it Ocean Protection Advocacy Kids. So that's how OPAC got its name. Um, we also got a camera and we walked around town and we took pictures of sea creatures that we would find and we would take pictures of the plastic that were floating along the beaches to put inside our little magazine. Later on, I went to college to become a teacher. I'm a music teacher and I still had OPAC in my mind. It was 
a life goal of mine to do something to teach kids about the ocean and how to do that creatively through artwork. So that's how OPAC came to be in 2016. All right. So I'm going to pass over the camera to our marine scientist, Jeffrey Morgan, because he's going to explain to you exactly how big is the ocean. Hi, guys. Thanks again for joining us today. So how big is the ocean? Well, it depends on how you're defining how big something is, if we're talking about the surface of the ocean or if we're including the deep depth that the ocean has. So our ocean is 71% of our planet's surface area. So if you were to look at a globe, just the outside of the globe, like the peel of an orange, that 71% of that is our ocean. Um, but if we're gonna include all of the depth of the ocean, our ocean is 99% of all living space on our planet. So if you had 100 pennies and you were to separate them so that you had 99 in one pile and one in another, the pile with 99 pennies would be all of the living space in the ocean. So the ocean is really big. And because it's so big, we actually don't know that much about it. We've only explored about 10% of our ocean. So there are a lot of creatures and critters and really cool organisms in our big blue planet that we haven't found yet. And we're really excited to be doing the uh, design your own sea creature today because you might make a sea creature that we haven't found yet. It might really exist. Uh, so we're really, really, <laughs> so really excited to uh, teach you a little bit about ocean adaptations and uh, teach you how to make your own ocean creature. I'm going to turn it back to, to Melanie now. All right, great. Thank you, Jeffrey. So what are adaptations? You might have heard about this word in school before, but we're just going to review it really quickly. And if you have never heard this word before, that's okay. So an adaptation is something an animal has that helps them survive in their habitat. For example, polar bears live in really cold temperatures like in the Arctic. And because they live in such cold temperatures, they need thick layers of fur and body fat to help them stay warm. That is an adaptation that that animal has uh, to survive. They also have white fur that blends in with the white snow. You might be aware of the word camouflage. They camouflage in with the white snow here. Okay. Then we're just having one little technical difficulty. All right, we're back. Okay. Hold on, our computer's not cooperating. Here we go. So um, another adaptation that polar bears have are really sharp teeth to eat meat. They're carnivores and their diet kits consists mostly of seals. And in order to hunt for those seals that they need to survive, they are really strong swimmers. That is a very important adaptation that these polar bears have. <clears throat> Now, their bodies also produce milk for their babies. This mother polar bear you see in the picture has two cubs. She, her body produces milk to feed those baby cubs. And you might be familiar that that makes these animals a mammal. And something really, really cool that not a lot of people know, polar bears are marine mammals. We're gonna talk about what that means a little bit later. But here we go. We're going to go into some ocean adaptations. Now, fish <clears throat> have special adaptations that help them survive in the water. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Can humans survive underwater? No, not very well. Not 
nope. <laughs> Not without a submarine or special equipment. So humans to survive, we need to breathe oxygen, right? We need to breathe in that air into our lungs. Fish have adapted to absorb oxygen in a very different way. They use their gills to absorb oxygen. Humans use their lungs to absorb ox oxygen. Fish need their gills um, for oxygen. All right, so another cool adaptation that some fish have are barbels. Not all fish have these. This fish you're seeing here is a catfish. Um, catfish and other fish that are similar to this fish have something called barbels. And basically they're these little whiskery things that are sensors so they can swim along the bottom sea floor and they can feel around for their food. Some fish can actually use their barbels as taste. They can taste with those barbels sometimes. All right, so another cool thing that fish have, another adaptation is counter shading. That is just a type of camouflage. So if you notice, the underbelly of this fish is white and the top of this fish is dark. That's called counter shading. If this fish, so if you could see my face here in the screen, if I, if the, I have my hand up here, if the bottom of my hand is the fish and the top of my hand is the fish, if it swims up and there's another fish underneath it and the fish looks up, it will see the white underbelly belly with blends in with the sky. If another fish were to swim over the catfish and it looks down, the back of the catfish will blend in with the sea floor, which is sand or dark and murky mud. All right, that's called counter shading. So one of my favorite adaptations that fish has are the lateral line and not everyone knows about this. The lateral line on the fish is that long line that you see starting from its head to its tail. That lateral line is um, a way for the fish to sense other fish around him or her. So if this, this catfish were to be swimming around in the sea and or river and another fish would swim by, the catfish will be able to feel the vibrations in the water and sense that other fish using its lateral line. Now, if you have a fish tank at home with a couple of fish in it, I encourage you at the end of this webinar to go to your fish tank and see if you can find your fish's lateral line. And if you don't have a fish tank at home, that's okay. You can grab a book and flip through some pages and see if you can trace the lateral line on the fish in the book. All right, so obviously fish need to be able to be really good swimmers because they live in the water. Um, so they have fins that propel them through the water and they just have a whole bunch of different fins. We're not gonna get into what the names mean, but they have lots of different fins that do lots of different things. All right, we're gonna get into some different kind of fish uh, and other interesting kinds of ocean adaptations. This oyster toadfish <clears throat> is probably maybe the ugliest fish you've ever seen. I don't know. I think it's kind of cute. This is my favorite fish in the whole world, and I am so excited to tell you about it. So the oyster toadfish lives um, mostly in oyster reefs around the east coast of the USA and other places, and they spend most of their time on the sea floor. They have a muddy appearance, which helps them blend in with the bottom of their muddy habitat. So if you look at this picture here, this fish looks like a big blob of mud. Or like, for me, it looks like a big blob of mud. That is its own way of camouflaging. So these fish are really, really often caught by fishermen on, on a fishing hooks. And a lot of times when fishermen see them, they say, oh, that fish is so ugly. I would never eat that fish. And then they throw it back in the water. But in fact, you might be surprised to learn that you can actually eat oyster toad fish. So I think <laughs> being a little bit ugly or not so nice looking is an adaptation for this fish because it prevents it from being eaten by humans. 
that is a pretty cool adaptation. All right. Oh, also, this fish at the top of its head has a poisonous barb. So if another animal were to put its jaws around the fish, that poisonous barb will sting them. So if you are ever fishing on the East Coast and you catch an oyster toe fish, be really careful because you might get stung by that poisonous barb. I have personally seen someone get stung before. And I just wanna let you know that they were okay. It didn't sting them too bad. They didn't have to go to the hospital, but it definitely did not feel good. So be careful. All right, so why is it called an oyster toadfish? It seems like it has way too many names. Well, it got its name from its slimy toad-like skin. It has a slimy mucus around its body. It also grows warts, just like a toad. And the most interesting thing about this fish is that it croaks like a frog. So I'm going to play the croaking noise. This might be a good time for you to put your volume up. All right, here's the croak. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? I'll play it again one more time in case you missed it. Awesome. I think that's the coolest thing about this fish. All right. So the oyster toadfish also gets its name because it eats oysters and shrimp and sometimes some other fish. So its jaws are really, really, really strong. So strong that it could crack open oyster shells. So another, if you do catch this fish out in the wild, you have to be careful of those really, really strong jaws. <clears throat> it also has a special adaptation called pharyngeal rasps. If you see that picture in the top corner of all its teeth, those are pharyngeal rasps. It's layers and layers of teeth that go down into its throat. That's how it eats its food. All right. This is a picture of me with an oyster toadfish. And I told you in the beginning that this is my favorite fish in the whole world. And I don't know who's happier in this picture, me or the oyster toadfish. <laughs> but this was a really cool day. I got to hold the fish. All right. Now. I know you're probably really excited to learn about some interesting uh, deep sea creatures. You might recognize some of these, so stay tuned. We're going to talk about some interesting deep sea creatures in a little bit. But first, we cannot forget those fluffy, cute sea otters. <laughs> so what is a marine mammal? Now, not all sea creatures use gills to survive in the water. Marine mammals, like humans, need to breathe oxygen from the air. So creatures like sea otters, dolphins, and humpback whales need to breathe the oxygen in the air. <clears throat> now, humpback whales, which is that whale at the bottom there, humpback whales, a cool adaptation that they have is that they can hold their breath up to 45 minutes. They don't do it all the time, but some humpback whales can hold their breath for that long. That is almost about the entire length of this entire webinar. Um, usually humpback whales will dive down into the water to, to look for food. And usually they'll stay under for about seven to 15 minutes, which is still a pretty long time. And then they come back to the surface, take a big breath, and they go right back down to hunt for more food. All right. So now it is time to dive real, real deep to learn about those deep sea creatures. So before we do that, you need to have some background knowledge about what it's like to be in the deep ocean. The deep ocean is a lot different than any other place on this planet. So here we go. I'm gonna play this video for you right now.
Deep in the Pacific Ocean, near China, there's a long crescent-shaped area that's one of the most special places on Earth. It's called the Mariana Trench, and it's the deepest part of the ocean. It's so far down that for a long time, scientists weren't even sure if anything could live there. But then we finally were able to explore it, and it turns out that there are some awesome forms of life down there. The Mariana Trench is almost 11,000 meters, or about 36,000 feet deep. It's hard to even imagine how far down that is, but think about how far you would go if you walked for two hours, like for as long as a movie. Yeah, that would be a really long walk, but you'd end up going pretty far, right? Yeah, well, that's about as far down as the deepest part of the ocean is. If you put the biggest mountain on Earth inside it, the top of the mountain wouldn't even come close to the surface of the water. And when you get that deep into the ocean, it becomes really hard for anything to survive. For one thing, it's super dark. The light from the sun can't go through all that water, and almost everything that's alive needs sunlight to live, so it's really important. It's also really cold. It's so cold that if it got even a tiny bit colder, the water would freeze into ice. And there's tons of pressure down there too. Pressure is what happens when something pushes on something else. Like if I press my hands against this table, my hands are putting pressure on the table. At the bottom of the Mariana Trench, all the water above creates lots of pressure. So much that it wouldn't be safe for people or almost any other living thing to swim around down there. The pressure would be way too strong. Between the darkness and the cold and the pressure, it's very hard for anything to survive at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. But there are some special types of life that can, like something called a sea cucumber. No, not that kind of cucumber, Squeaks. Even though they have a similar name, sea cucumbers aren't anything like the cucumber fruit we eat in salad sometimes. They're animals. They kind of look like big worms, and they live on the ocean floor, where they look for things to eat, like tiny animals, so small you wouldn't even be able to see them. Another type of animal that lives in the deepest part of the ocean are amphipods, which look a little bit like shrimp. Most of the animals that are similar to amphipods and live in other places are are pretty small. They usually only get about a centimeter long or about as long as a fingernail. But the amphipods at the bottom of the Mariana Trench are much bigger. They can be 20 centimeters long or about the size of a grown-up's hand. There are also lots of another type of living thing called foraminifera, or just forams for short, that live in the deepest part of the ocean. There are more than 400 kinds of them living in the Mariana Trench. And they're not animals or plants or even fungi like mushrooms. Mushrooms. They're a type of living thing called a protist. These forams can be about the same size as the amphipods, or even bigger, up to 30 centimeters long. All the types of life in the deepest part of the ocean are soft with no hard bones. They can't have bones because the pressure down there is so strong that it would just turn them into mush. That strong pressure also makes it very hard for us humans to go explore the Mariana Trench, which is why there's a lot scientists still don't know about about it. We can send people down there in special types of submarines that keep them safe from the pressure and the cold. Or we can send robots without people. I know, Squeaks, I would love to go exploring there too. But it's very hard and expensive to build submarines or robots that can go that far down. Scientists have only done it a few times. So we know a little bit about what's down in the deepest part of the ocean, but a lot of it is still a big mystery. Thanks for joining us. If you want to keep learning and having fun with Squeaks and me, hit the red subscribe button and we'll see you next time here at the fort. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that video. And like she said, we don't know a lot about that deep, the deep ocean because it's really, really difficult to get there for humans. So the first deep sea creature that we are going to learn about is the vampire squid. And this vampire squid has really interesting adaptations that helped it survive in the deep sea. Now, the vampire squid you might be surprised to learn that it is not a squid, it's not an octopus, and it's definitely not a vampire. So what is it? <laughs> well, the answer is the vampire squid is its own classification. It's not a squid and it's not an octopus, but it has the characteristics of both. Scientists 
think, we're not sure, we think that vampire squids um, are what squids and octopus adapted or evolved from. The vampire squid has been on our planet for more than a hundred million years and it hasn't changed at all. So let's learn a little bit more about what we know. Now, not much is known about this mysterious creature, but we do know that it lives more than 2,000 feet deep into the ocean. That is almost complete darkness. It's not complete darkness. I'm going to tell you why, because there's something special down in the deep ocean that gives it a little bit of light. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Now, because it's so dark in the deep ocean, the vampire squid has gigantic eyes. And the reason it has really, really big eyes is to let in as much light as possible so it could see. Those big eyes are a really, really important adaptation. Now, the vampire squid, squid also has fins. It looks like ears, but those things on top of its head, those are actually fins that helps it propel through the water. Now, I'm sure you've noticed that really long strand. It looks like it's coming out of its nose. That's called a filament. That is what the vampire squid uses to eat its food. The vampire squid is a scavenger, which means it eats dead plankton and particles along the ocean floor. It uses that filament um, because the filament has a bunch of little sticky hairs attached to it and the dead plankton and particles along the ocean floor get stuck to the sticky parts of the filament and then it brings it in and eats all that delicious plankton and particles. So um, you may be asking yourself, what are plankton? Plankton are just creatures that cannot swim against a current. Some plankton are really big, like jellyfish. Jellyfish are really big. And some plankton are really small microscopic creatures, okay? And when those really small microscopic plankton die, they sink down, 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 down to the ocean floor. And that's what the vampire squid eats. All right. So the vampire squid does not have ink. If this vampire squid were to have black ink, just like other squids in the ocean, that black ink would not do it very good, right? Because it's in a black ocean. Why would it sp spray black ink? Instead, the vampire squid sprays a bioluminescent substance which glitters and confuses predators. They actually spray something that glows in the dark. I'm going to show you a quick video about what bioluminescence is. It is one, I think, one of the most interesting things or interesting adaptations that fish have in the deep ocean. The light is generated by bacteria that live permanently inside the lure, which attracts prey to these murderous teeth. There are all sorts of lures out in the darkness. Come into my mouth, little fish. And what is the purpose of this lure suspended on a long rod way below its owner's terrifying set of teeth? difficult to be sure. But then this monster does have another giant flashing lure much closer to its mouth. These fish are called anglers because they use their lures in much the same way as fly fishermen use their imitation flies. squid with huge eyes, this glimmer is intriguing. It 
it might just be food. A satisfying meal for a fish with a highly extendable stomach. So that's all about bioluminescence. So right now what you're seeing is our vampire squid the ha actually has bioluminescence at the end of its tentacles. Now, this vampire squid, it looks a little bit creepy and a little bit intimidating, but don't worry, the vampire squid is actually completely harmless. Harmless. It's actually really, really gentle because it's a scavenger, right? It's not a predator. It's not hunting food like a shark does. It's just collecting dead plankton and particles. But as a self-defense mechanism, it makes itself look scarier. Um, so scientists think that um, vampire squids use their bioluminescence on their tentacles mostly for communication. Vampire squid are extremely rare. So it would be like, um, I don't know, it would be really difficult for a vampire squid to find another vampire squid to make more vampire squid babies, right? So they use their lights to communicate with other vampire squid. We think, we're not quite sure yet. All right, so here's another defense mechanism that the vampire squid has. It can actually turn its body inside out. It's so cool and there's many reasons why it does this. The first reason it does this is because it actually protects its head and internal organs from other predators. So it's flipping its body inside out and creating more protection for itself. It also makes him look a little bit scarier. So if you notice underneath, it looks like it has a bunch of these spikes that might seem dangerous. But in reality, they're not dangerous at all. They're actually really squishy. <laughs> it's kind of like putting on a Halloween costume to make yourself look scarier, even though you're not really scary at all. That's what this vampire squid is doing. Okay, so we're gonna move on to another deep sea creature. This is a deep sea hatchet fish. And I think this is the cutest fish that I have ever seen. <laughs> it has those big eyes. So as you know already, um, it needs those big eyes to see in the deep, dark, dark ocean. It lives in almost complete darkness. And we learned that the deep sea is not really completely dark because of bioluminescence, right? So this fish lives about 5,000 feet deep. That's way deeper than our vampire squid and not much is known about this fish. We do know that it is about six inches long. They are quite small and they have those big large eyes to absorb as much light as possible. <clears throat> Their eyes are also stuck upwards. It's like they're constantly looking up and they do that because this fish needs to hunt for its food and the food that it eats swims above it. So this fish is constantly looking up for a tasty snack or a tasty treat. Okay, so our deep sea ha hatchet fish also has bioluminescence and it's called a hatchet fish because their body is shaped like a hatchet or an ax. So they use their bioluminescence to confuse bigger fish and other predators. And they have a special kind of bioluminescence. They use a technique called counter illumination, which means they can change the intensity of their light. It's like dimming the lights. They can brighten it and dim it however they want you to confuse their predators. All right, so that is the um, end of our portion of learning about some deep sea creatures. I hope you learned a whole lot about some different ocean adaptations. And before we let you go, we are going to do our Q&A, but I wanna talk to you really quick um, about ocean advocacy. So advocacy means that um, you care about something so, so much that you wanna do something to help it or speak up for it. 
I am an ocean advocate. I love the ocean. And the way I advocate for the ocean is teaching kids like you how to protect it. And you can be advocates for the ocean too, right from your homes. So some ways that you can do that is when it's safe to be in large groups of people, you can conduct a local beach cleanup. Or if you do not live near the ocean, because not everyone lives near the ocean, you can do something called skipping the straw or skipping single use plastics. There's a lot of plastic pollution in our ocean and it's really important for us to reduce or reuse, refuse and recycle plastic. Um, and also what I think is most important is be the voice that the ocean needs. The ocean can't talk for itself and it's our job to speak out and tell the ocean's story. All right, and I have our little otter saying, thank you for caring. Okay, I'm gonna quickly show you our DIY, which is create your ocean creature. And I hope you can see me okay in that screen there. So I have an example here <clears throat> of a deep sea creature. All right, so here's a deep sea creature that one of our students made, and this is going to be your project. There is a worksheet on our OPAC website where you can find the directions, but basically what you're going to do is search around your house for things that you can use to build your sea creature. So this one is made out of a toilet paper roll here and some pipe cleaners. You can also use Legos. If you have Legos at home, you can use Legos to build. You can use plastic water bottles. You can use paper, paper towel rolls, anything you find. So this is a deep sea creature that one of our students made. It is called the curly squid. <laughs> they named it the curly squid. It has these curly tentacles that help it catch its food. It has really sharp teeth because it's a carnivore. It eats meat. This, this type of pretend squid eats meat. It also has really big eyes to see sea in the dark, dark deep ocean. And this person put eyes around its whole body. So this squid is not missing anything. It could see around its whole body. It also looks like it has an antenna um, as sensors and some curly hairs at the top, which makes it that curly squid. All right. So we're going to move on here back to our slideshow. Okay, so that is how to create your own ocean creature from home. Um, if you want to learn more about what we talked about, you can find all of these sources and videos on our OPAC website, that is opakedu.org, opakedu.org. And now it's time for our Q&A. So if you have those questions that you just really need answers to, I'm gonna turn the camera over to our, um, well, our marine science scientist is nearby so he can help answer some questions. I'm gonna take a look here. Oh, how long, I see one here. It says, how long does a vampire squid live? I'm not sure if we know. Um, scientists are still trying to learn about the vampire squid. They can observe it in um, aquariums, but if you could imagine an aquarium is very different than the deep ocean. An aquarium is not a natural habitat for the vampire squid. We actually have to physically go down into the deep ocean to observe it. So Maybe one day we will know how long it lives. Um, how did the vampire squid get its name? That's a good question. So the vampire squid got its name because of its red, red, deep, dark color. It also, when it, I don't know if you remember, when it opened up those tentacles, it kind of looks like a bat because all the tentacles are, tentacles are connected with the skin around it, just like a bat has, or a cape. It kind of looks like a cape. <laughs> Let's see here. How many vampire squid are estimated there? Um, we don't know. We do know they are rare, but we are not sure how many. And no, I have never met a vampire squid. Maybe one day. I don't know. 
Um, let's see, can I get a pet otter? Oh, I don't know if you have in your home a natural habitat for an otter to survive, um, but some aquariums let you sponsor an otter so you can donate to help the, the care of an otter. You can certainly research that. <clears throat> Um, someone asked, where did you get all this wonderful information? You can find all of our sources on our website. Um, let's see. If some sea creatures are bioluminescent, wouldn't it also show off its location so other fish could eat it? That's very true. Um, yeah, I don't know. Jeffrey, what do you think? Um, so Thank you, Jeffrey. So I'm just scrolling around here to, to find some more <clears throat> questions here. How big is an isopod? So some isopods are very small, but in the deep ocean, they get pretty big. Like the girl said, as big as your hand, that's quite big for an isopod. Now, if there are any questions that we don't get to or that Jeffrey and I don't know the answers to, we're gonna write these all down. And what we do on our um, Facebook is we do an ocean facts um, series where we write down all of your questions and then we put an answer. So some of the questions we might need to research a little bit. All right, I'm just gonna answer maybe about one or two more. Um, why do anglerfish have a light? Well, in that video we watched, that anglerfish, that specific one, was using it as a lure. So it was tricking other fish into thinking that that lure um, is food. So a smaller fish might see that, that lure and go, mm, Hmm, that looks tasty. That looks like a little fish, but in reality, it's actually a big giant um, angler fish. And that's how the angler fish catches its food and catches its bait. So are any of the squid, oh, I just saw a question about um, the squids being poisonous. I don't think the vampire squid is poisonous. <laughs> Um, the only fish that is venomous that we learned about is that oyster toadfish. It has the poisonous barb at the top of its head. Have you written any marine biology songs? Oh my goodness, that's really cool. So um, yes, we have written some songs about the ocean um, with our students actually. They, <clears throat> they put it on our website. So you can go onto our website and listen to the songs that we have wrote. Um, there's also some other really cool songs about adaptations. I have a friend who is in a band and they write songs for children about sea creatures. They're called Funkin' Ships. Um, and I will link a song on our Facebook page. So you can go to our OPAC Facebook page and I will put that adaptation song. It's a really cool song about ocean adaptations. All right. So I think that wraps up our day. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you learned a whole lot. If you have any other questions, please feel free to send us an email or a message on Facebook. We are, are so happy to answer as many questions you have as possible. We are doing another webinar tomorrow and on Friday, or, and on Thursday, sorry, um, at one o'clock. So if you are interested in learning more, Come join us again. Thank you, everyone. Stay happy and healthy. Bye-bye.